It's a miracle. Let's celebrate an undefeated lion season so far. Come on. Yeah, you're just a little excited. That's all right. We got some Packers fans in the room, too. I know it's okay. It's all good. Hey, so excited about today because we're kind of officially uh, moving into another season. And I've been thinking about all the churches around America today that uh, are just entering into this weekend after Labor Day and all the great things that we all have in store ahead of us for this new kind of ministry season. That's how we look like, that's how we think about it in the church. So just excited about what's happening and so glad you're here with us in the house on Daybreak Live. And I want to give you a quick preview of where we're going to go this year because every year I take a couple weeks and just ask for God's direction for Daybreak for the upcoming year. And I want you to know that as I think and pray and prepare, I'm always aware that at any time God could divert and change or step in. And I always want us to be a church that's willing to, to lean into those moments where we might feel like we need to change maybe what we had planned. But I also believe that plans are important and plans are things that keep us on track. And so let me talk to you about where we're going this year. So we're going to start off this series talking about supernatural and how God moves in the supernatural. And we're going to talk about miracles. We're going to talk about expectations. We're going to talk about what God does in moments where heaven and earth can collide in spectacular fashion. And I'm excited over the next few weeks. In fact, those of you that are familiar to Daybreak, we're going to start our growth guide starting tomorrow. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but we're going to kick it off by talking about the supernatural world. Then we're going to talk about the idea of moving and how God takes us from one place to another and what happens in the process of when God decides to call upon our lives and move us somewhere What does he do around us and within us that's so important? Now, believe it or not, that leads us up to Christmas. And in Christmas, we're going to talk about the journey. We're going to talk about the journey that Christ himself went through to come here to live amongst us, but also the journey that others took and and that we take to go and to find him. And that leads us to the new year. We're going to talk about this idea of ID. Who are we? I always believe that it's important for us to know that we can't understand who we are unless we first know who God is. And God, who is he and who are we as a result? Because we are made in his image and we're going to kick off the new year in a pretty exciting fashion. All right, after that, I honestly can't remember, so I'm going to need to rely on the screen. There we go. Did you know that there's a whole book in the Bible about heroes? We're going to talk about it's the book of Judges, the people that God raised up to be his leaders. So I'm pretty excited about that as well. And then I believe after that, we're going to talk about this conversation that changes the world. There's there's a conversation I believe is more important than any one that we could ever have. And we're going to spend a few weeks talking about that conversation, what that means to us. After that, we're going to talk about poetic justice. How do we live in a world where the values that we might see around us might conflict with the ones within us? And what can we do to be messengers of hope and truth in the world? That's a a challenge that a lot of us are facing every day at our work, at school, in our neighborhoods, and we're going to have open conversations about that. Then after that, we're going to talk about what it means to be new. Jesus is in the business of making us new and all things new. And what happens when our life is changed from the inside out? Now, as we do that, we have a reading from the Bible every day found in this packet. And I want every single one of you here in the house to pick up one of these before you go. We charge our costs to do this, but these are amazing tools for you in your marriage individually And in your everyday life, you might want to pack these around with you at work. We've also got one for students as well. As a church, we all do this together. But you know what I might be the most excited about is this, is what we have for our kids. Our team here at Daybreak has gone above and beyond what I can imagine. And in this daily interactive guide, parents listen. 
If you want to raise your kids to know about faith, if you want to raise your kids to be aware of the stories of the Bible, if you want to raise your kids to have a strong foundation in your life, then you absolutely need to pick up one of these. This is a way that you can interact with your your child every day in a way that's fun and exciting. And as we're talking about this in here, our children are talking about the same ideas and so are our students. And these are just absolutely must-haves if you're if you're a parent. And over the years of ministry that I've had in 30 years, what I've heard the most from parents is, how do I raise my kids in faith? And we've done everything we can do to provide the opportunity uh, for you to do that as families and parents. So please take advantage of what we have. This is something that we have done here in the house ourselves. Our staff wrote this and worked on this, and they've just done a a fantastic job. So I'm so excited about what's happening. And as students kick off tonight, they'll be experiencing this as well. And these growth guides are just so simple to use. It has a a daily interactive guide for you. It keeps you connected to your faith on a daily basis. It, It allows you to just very simply open it up day by day, and there's just something right there. You can spend as much or as little time as you'd like in this. So if you're intimidated, maybe say, I don't even know where to start when I read the Bible. I hear that a lot. This is just such a great way to do that. But then it also does something to connect you to others. Because we need each other. We need each other in this journey of life. And this is a great way to do it. And another step that you might want to take as we think about kind of this new beginning is what we call growth groups around here. Growth groups are a place where you can get together with others and literally just discuss what you are learning. And there's all different kind of groups you see here. There's neighborhood groups, affinity groups, work groups. You might, if you're a student, you might want to have a discussion during lunch with some of your friends. It might be a way that you can reach out to some neighbors or coworkers or even in your family to sit down every day and just go over what we're learning. But it's just a way to stay connected because we really do need each other in this life. I want to thank you personally. I just want to take a minute to say thank you for your support and encouragement. Over the last few weeks, we've talked about justice, and we released the film this week, and it was just such a highlight for me as your pastor to have some moments together. And so many of you I've not been able to see that were actually able to be there, and I know that your time is so valuable, but... But for those of you that were able to be there for the premiere Wednesday, I want to say thank you. It's just, it was a a moment for me. And beyond just what about me, I think that what we learned over the last few weeks and what God is speaking to us about justice in the world is so important. And, And many of you have asked, and I'm kind of getting overwhelmed by people wondering, well, if I wasn't able to see it then, then, um, Where can I see it? Well, we found out Wednesday night there's there's actually a bootleg copy that was already put on the Internet, believe it or not, but we pulled that down. Um, But we are going to maybe arrange something here at Daybreak. If you weren't able to see it before it kind of gets released elsewhere, you can do that. I want to talk to you today about the supernatural. I want to introduce you to this idea. As I was thinking about that, the miracles in Scripture, particularly the miracles that Jesus was a part of, that he performed, thought about there is one miracle that stands out because in the Bible there are four different recordings of the life and teachings of Jesus. They're called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in all four of those Gospels, there's different stories that are in there. And I'm thankful for that. There's different teachings, different different events that happened to Jesus. Some focus more on certain areas, maybe his birth or maybe his ministry. But there's one story that's found in all four, and that's rare. Beyond his crucifixion and his death and resurrection, we don't find all the stories in all four necessarily, but we do find one. And we're going to look at that story. In fact, this story... I think it may be it's an all four. This is my conjecture here because it impacted his disciples so much. It was memorable. It was amazing. It was pretty astounding what they experienced together. And we're going to look at it in John chapter 6. So in John chapter 6, we read this. 
Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. It's important to remember why they were following Jesus, and we found it right there. So Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover was near. You've got to wonder, why did he include that little bit of information? We'll get back to that. So when Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for all these people to eat? Now he asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, it would take more than a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted, and he did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Pretty crazy story. It's supernatural. It's something we can't explain. And when you think about all the characters that were there in this moment, I want to start with us thinking about the crowd. Why was the crowd there, and why was there such a big crowd? And John mentioned that. It was near the the Passover, which was a big deal. In fact, where this happened was kind of this this main road where people were to travel to get to the, the Passover celebration. But as the people were gathering there, more and more people started showing up. And here's what we see is that they were just looking for the supernatural. They were trying to find something that was out of the ordinary, something that they knew that Jesus might do because Jesus was the miracle man. He was the healer. When they were around Jesus, they didn't see things they saw anywhere else. Jesus performed miracles that they had heard about. But maybe they not necessarily had seen it. We live in a world that's looking for miracles. So on September 10th, 1945, a long time ago, a guy was preparing dinner, and because they had chickens, he thought, well, you know, tonight we're going to have a chicken dinner. Now, I grew up, my dad always wanted to be a chicken farmer. My dad was raised on a farm, and so... Because he didn't get to fulfill his dream of being a chicken farmer, we had chickens in our house. And I remember the day that uh, I realized that what we had on our plate was what I saw outside. You know what I mean? I didn't really make the connection. And one day, I asked my dad, well, how do you, you know, how does this transfer happen? And he said, well, I can show you if you'd like. You ready? And uh, I was like, well, yeah, I was probably about six years old. And uh, my dad said, now, are you sure you're ready for this? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. You know, as a, as a young six-year-old could be, I was ready. So he said, now, this is going to be a little weird. He kind of prepared me. I'm like, dad, come on, let's go. I'm ready. Come on. And so my dad, being an old farmer, like, he didn't use any instrument other than his hands. And so he picked up that chicken and without any hesitation, just did one of these real quick. He had this move that he had and all of a sudden he was holding a head in his hand and there was a body on the ground now if you've ever seen this in person imagine through a six-year-old's eyes the chaos the I mean I was frightened and but on September 10th 1945 this man decided to kind of do that thing except he used an axe and he decided tonight they were going to eat Mike Here's a picture of Mike. Something kind of happened. And so from September 10th, 1945 to March 17th, 1947, Mike continued to live on without his head. The Guinness, he's in the Guinness Book. Mike the Headless Chicken is in the Guinness Book for having the longest lifespan without a head. Now, that's a miracle. That's not maybe a miracle that you might be expecting, but just to grab our attention here. But, you know, we're, we're kind of surrounded with miracles all the time. I think about 
the miracles of nature. And I read this recently about the dandelion. Look at this picture of a dandelion. Dandelion, it's said that represents the celestial bodies, the sun. You see it there in bloom, the moon, and even the stars as the spores can spread. The beauty of a dandelion, which a lot of us I know don't like in our yards, but in many cultures and many places and throughout history, the dandelion has been seen as a beautiful thing. It's the things that we might see every day that God just embedded in his creation that we look at with our eyes and maybe we take for granted, but they almost might even be supernatural. Pew Research says that 79% of Americans believe in miracles. Basically, 8 out of 10 of us believe in miracles. And even further, some recent data says that 39% of Americans said that they've had a miracle happen in their own life individually. That means that over 90 million of us here in this country believe that God did something very specific, very individual for us in our life, that we believe that God performed a miracle just for us. So we are a generally a culture that believes and understands that there's something beyond this natural world. There's something different. There are miracles that happen. And a lot of us are looking for miracles. And that's exactly what was going on with the crowd. They were looking for the supernatural. They were seeking it. And we live in a world that wants to find the supernatural. And some of us are willing to even pay for it. But I think here's something important for us to know is that when we're following Jesus, if your life is devoted to him, you can be someone who seeks the miracle. And then when the miracle doesn't happen or when the miracle is over, you're not really a follower anymore. And Jesus actually would refer to the crowds and he said, if you want to find your life, you need to lose it. It's not just about what you get. It's about what you give and what you sacrifice. So my encouragement as we think about the crowd is the crowd was there seeking the supernatural, but who would be left when the miracles were over? Are we following him for the right reasons? And then we have this conversation that Jesus has with Philip. Jesus says to Philip, hey, there's a lot of people here. And where can we get them something? Now, the reason that almost certainly he asked Philip this is because Philip was from that area. He was like, Philip, you know what's around here. Where's the nearest McDonald's? You know, what, where, what, what do we have around here that we could find? What, what are the resources? And Philip starts to look at and analyze the situation, says it, it would take six months wages for us to do this. I mean, there is no way, Jesus, that... We can figure this out on the spot. Now, we know that Jesus, if you caught when we read, it said he was testing the disciples. Hey, I know what I want to do. And internally, Jesus is ready for the miracle, but Philip isn't quite seeing it yet. All Philip could see was what was in his sight right in front of him, but he couldn't see beyond that or through that. And Jesus here is inviting Philip and the other disciples to peer through the veil of the earthly and to look into the heavenly. What is beyond? But all Philip could see was the natural. Scripture talks about our limited perspective. 1 Corinthians. It says that now we see only as a reflection in a mirror. But then, speaking of when we're in eternity, we will see face to face. The author here, the Apostle Paul, says, Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully. You know what that speaks? The fact that we can just see a little bit. Psalm 147 talks about the perspective of God. Great is the Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Isaiah 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. God has a bigger perspective. God sees beyond what we can see. Our, our vision is so limited. And we have to remind ourselves over and over that the benefit that we have when we follow Jesus is that we have his vision, not just ours. So when, when things look bleak, when you're looking at the natural, when things look impossible, when you start analyzing the situation and it, there just doesn't seem to be a solution, 
God says, my ways are much, much higher than your ways. My understanding has no limit. But what we see is so microscopic. It's so small. It's so limited. We think about our perspective compared to God's. I want you to take a look at this picture and tell me what you see here. This is a, a picture under an electron microscope. I don't know if you have any guesses, but here's actually really what it is, which is something that might be in your body right now, a coffee bean. Think about what we see compared to reality. Let's look at this one. What do you think this might be? Well, let's take a look at what it is. Limited perspective versus a larger one. Here's another one. This might be on your body right now. In fact, I hope this is on your body right now because this is what it is. Yes. Raise your hands if this is... No, I'm not going to do that. Okay. One more. Ooh, what is this? Some of you are you're catching on here. This is what it is. Most of us have that somewhere. A human hair. And when we think about our perspective, it's just so limited. I remember we were starting a campaign for Never the Same a few years ago for National Youth Ministry, just trying to figure some things out. And we wanted to launch this national campaign. And to do that, we calculated we needed $180,000. And so several months ahead of that, the deadline that we needed it, which was by the end of May, we started strategizing and talking and meeting and getting people together. And we did what you are supposed to do in that situation. When you fundraise, you're supposed to start having meetings with people and conversations. And we put together events and I would make the pitch. And after months and months of doing this, nobody gave. And it was one of the most discouraging things because not only were, was no one giving, but the fact that we needed what to me seemed an an unsurmountable amount of money knowing that up to that point and what we had done, we'd never only a handful of times received any five-figure gifts, but we were talking well into the six figures. It was so far beyond us. It was ridiculous. And I came to a point where I said, God, I need a miracle because this isn't working. I've tried so hard and I keep asking and nothing's happening. And it was so discouraging. And when you need a miracle and you don't get one and you're praying and you're struggling and you've been there, you start to ask yourself, God, am I, am I on the right track? Am I doing the right thing? I just don't know what to do. So I decided right before the deadline to give one last ditch effort. And I said, I'm going to fast and go without food for two weeks. And I'm going to pray and ask that your direction would be clear. We found ourselves at the end of April going through that and then going into May, we were out in Washington, D.C. for the National Day of Prayer. And as we were there, I was, we were getting ready to have a lunch at a fancy hotel in downtown Washington, D.C. And we got a phone call from someone that said, hey, I'd like to give towards this. And it was a phone call out of the blue. In fact, we were literally walking out the door towards this lunch to have this meeting and, and a discussion about this idea. And they said, we want to give $30,000 towards this. And this just kind of caught me by surprise. It kind of blew my mind. I thought, okay, maybe God's doing something here. We got in our Uber and we got to the hotel. And I'm nervous. And, you know, in, in Washington, D.C., it's pretty common to be what, what's called wearing the uniform, you know. So we're all dressed up and wearing the suit. And so I'm walking into this hotel. And, and I'm just thinking, okay. I can remember everything to say, and I'm nervous, and it's just a big moment. I thought this could be the biggest moment of my life. And when I, I remember stepping out of the Uber, and my clothes felt kind of weird, like something wasn't right. And all of a sudden, I realized, like, there's something, like, lodged right here in my pants. So I went into the bathroom and realized that when I had done laundry, a pair of my underwear kind of got just fit right in there and my leg just slid right in there and I didn't realize I'm like yeah well this is a great start it didn't feel like a miracle moment you know what I mean so 
But what do you do with an extra pair of underwear in a fancy hotel in D.C.? I'm not going to tell you what I did. But we sat down in that meeting. And by then, it was like the pressure was off. I'd already done everything I could. I just simply shared the vision. Later that day, on May 3rd, we received a check for $200,000. Just like that. I'm telling you, even if our perspective is limited, God's isn't. And, and God can do miracles. Which brings me to the boy. The boy that gave what he had. He was willing to sacrifice the little that he had. And this story, what we read is that he brought five barley loaves and two fish. So here's kind of what that looks like. You might be thinking loaves like we would think loaves. Think more like a roll. Think of like a dinner roll. Barley bread actually was the, the poorest bread, so to speak. It was the bread that, that was really the cheapest and the easiest, and it just the poor had it. And I think there's something so special about that little tidbit that John gives us, that the little boy brought these five little cheap dinner rolls, and then the fish, you might be thinking Michigan fish, but these were basically like little sardines from the sea. Wasn't much. Jesus, in another version of this story, in one of the other gospels, he says to his disciples, well, go and find out what we have. See what's out there. And this little boy brought what he had. And the conversation, Andrew says, listen, here's, here's all that we have. And how far can this go? It would take six months wages. See, when your perspective is limited, you start analyzing the data, right? And you think, well, this can't happen. And if you're an analytic person, sometimes that can rob you of the miracle because you're thinking, okay, you know, God, this doesn't make sense, and it doesn't work out on paper. And that's exactly what was happening in this moment. They brought these little dinner rolls and these two little sardines, and they said, this is what we have. This is it. But Jesus, we don't know how far this would go. But the little boy gave what he had. This was basically like his sack lunch. But it always starts somewhere. You know, in fundraising, there's this term called the lead gift. And it's really crazy. I, I learned about this, and I've seen it really come true, that when someone is willing to give first, even anonymously, even if no one else knows about it, if there's a project where there's a need and someone just steps forward first and they provide the lead gift, here's what's crazy, is that everyone else starts following it just takes someone to step forward first. And I wonder if you have the heart and spirit and generosity to be a lead giver. Are you willing to step forward first when you see the need and not wait for someone else? It reminds me in this rather economically depressed developing country, a church gathered together one Sunday morning and this Sunday morning was different because the night before there was a storm that ripped through their community and the roof no longer existed on their poor little church building. And the pastor shared the need and he said, would you give so that we can provide a roof so that when we gather together, we're out of the elements to worship. And as the baskets went around, the pastor watched in discouragement as no one gave. And then there's an elderly gentleman in the back who didn't have a home. And very quietly, very discreetly, and very gently, he took the hat off of his head, the old straw hat, and put it in the basket. Now, we would look at that and we would say, it's an old straw hat. It doesn't mean anything. But actually, when people realized what this man had done, they gasped in amazement. Because to him, that straw hat represented his shelter from the elements and even his pillow at night. It was mostly all that he had. And when he provided that lead gift, 
You know what happened? The church that day funded the roof because of the sacrifice of this man. And I'm telling you, when God's ready to do the supernatural, he needs sometimes someone to provide the material for the miracle. And that's the privilege that we have as followers of Jesus is to maybe be called to provide the miracle with the material that we give. Then we have Jesus. Jesus obviously is the centerpiece of this story. He supplied in that moment for something supernatural. That Jesus was there. And I've wondered myself and I've asked the question, would Jesus have performed the miracle if the boy had not given what he had? It's a question to ask ourselves. I don't know if I can answer it with certainty, but I will say this, that Jesus was testing his disciples. And here's what I want you to think about. If you're familiar with the story of Jesus, you know that he had these closest 12 disciples that he designated to be apostles. They were mainly young men, and he called them out from all different kind of careers. But several of them we know from the story of scripture had a certain type of occupation that they came from when they began to follow Jesus. Do you know what that occupation was? Some of them were fishermen in the group. And I want you to think about this for a minute. Jesus says, what do we have out there? And I don't know if it ever crossed their minds to think, well, maybe we should just go out and start fishing. And probably they didn't think that for maybe an obvious reason. Why would they not automatically think, well, we'll just go out and do what we do. I mean, fish were provided and they're fishermen, so... They were right there by water. Why didn't they do this? I think it didn't cross their mind because they realized there's no way that the little that we could do in the little time that we have could go so far. So they didn't understand what Jesus was inviting them into. He was inviting them into a moment so that they could comprehend that often we provide the material for the miracle. That's what happened. And maybe you're looking for a miracle and you're waiting and watching and maybe God is asking you to sacrificially give to provide the material through an invitation, through a commitment, through a gift, through a conversation through something sacrificial. I received a text message just within the last couple days from one of our elders, a prayer. I want to read this. I want you to prepare yourself for miracles. I want us to prepare ourselves for miracles at daybreak. I was so moved by this. It, it actually provided a lot of juice for me to be up here right now at this moment when I read this on my phone. In Jesus' name, Lord, help those who are lost to accept, receive, and commit to following Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, let those who have walked away return to you. In Jesus' name, change the hearts of those who have given up on church or are angry with God who despise Christianity. Let them come to your house and open their eyes. And see all that you have planned for them. In Jesus' name, I pray for lives to be changed, broken relationships to be healed, forgiveness to win, for marriages and families to be restored, for mental and physical healing, for those who attend daybreak to let the Holy Spirit fill their souls so that every day they walk in gratitude for the great gift of freedom that you have given to each one of us. God, forgive us as followers of you for anything we have done to push people away from the church and let those who follow Jesus Christ be overly sensitive in our interactions with others that we only exude the deep love and light of our Father in heaven. Let us be a church community that honors you and prioritizes prayer and grows in our intimate relationship with you. In Jesus' name, fill all 168 prayer slots before September 16th. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And fill our church with the Holy Spirit and let us do unsearchable and unimaginable things beyond what we could ever imagine or comprehend as your people. Let us impact our community, state, and nation in the world by generously giving our time, talent, and money in any way that can only be credited to you. 
If you're looking for a miracle, if you need a miracle, some of you need a miracle in your marriage. And God wants to provide a miracle. Some of you need a miracle in a broken relationship that God wants to provide it. Some of you are asking for a miracle at work or a breakthrough financially. Some of you are are begging God that he would do something in or around you. Maybe not even just for you, but maybe having the eyes of Jesus as he looked upon this crowd and had compassion. You're asking for a miracle for someone else. And there's a moment that we can peer and peek through and actually step into a place where heaven and earth collide in a spectacular moment and God does something supernatural that cannot be explained. But often the supernatural comes through sacrifice. Often it's the material for the miracle that Jesus is waiting for us to step forward and give. And so if you're a parent and you want your children to grow up in faith, you got to provide the miracle by laying a foundation of faith in their lives. If you want a miracle in your marriage, you've got to provide the material to make sure that you're doing everything you can to bring hope and healing into that relationship. If you want a miracle for someone else who's far from God, are you giving your time and efforts in prayer? There are no guaranteed answers, but here's what I know, that there are often times that when we just step forward with the little that we have in our poverty, God, he does something that only he could do. And I don't know about you, but that's what I want to see in my life. I want to live a life that can't be explained. I want to be a part of a church community that can't be explained. I want to see God do things beyond what I can even comprehend. Now, one of the prayers of the elders that I read to you mentioned that we wanted to have all 168 slots filled. Some of you know what this is. Some of you may not. It's something that we're doing. It's called Project 168. And Project 168 is a commitment to be here at daybreak in that beautiful prayer room that one of our own students designed for one hour a week for the next six weeks for the duration of the series, beginning next week. I'm just going to be real transparent with you. I've been so burdened. I've been so burdened that we could feel the miracles of God. But it's not just going to come by us sitting back and watching it happen. And some of you maybe have never thought of this. Maybe you've been invited. Maybe you've said no. But I, I've been asking God fervently. Fill up. Every slot for people that want to see a miracle in their life. For people that want to see a miracle in our church. For people that want to see lost people be found here. For marriages to be healed. For our community to be reached. For us to be helping the poor in ways that we never knew we could. And I know it only happens when we pray. I've experienced it, and I don't want us to miss this. I I am doing everything I can to encourage you as your pastor to be a part of what I know God wants to do supernaturally at daybreak. This is one step you can take to join us in this really important moment, I believe, in our church. As you think about your life, as you think about this community if you're part of daybreak what would it look like if miracles happened and they became a regular part of what we experience i know that can happen and so my encouragement to you before you leave today parents students adults engage in scripture this year all the materials are right there Pick one of those up on the way out. Also, in the lounge, there are the sign-up sheets to fill up Project 168. I want every single one of you, the regular part of daybreak, to step over there and say, I'm going to participate. I want to see miracles in my life. I want to see miracles in my church. Let's do it together. Let's see God move in ways we've never seen. 
As I prayed and prepared many months ago for this series, I asked, God, what do you want to do? And I believe that the Lord spoke to me and said, I want to show Daybreak the supernatural world in ways they've never seen. I'm excited to see what God's about to do. So we have prayer partners available every week. Hope you find one if you need a miracle in your life. I invite you to stand with me here in the house as we close this time in prayer. Lord, we invite you into our lives. We invite you to to do what you can do, to do what we can't do. Lord, there are many here that are seeking the supernatural. And Lord, we know that your hand can do far beyond what we could ever ask, think, or imagine. And so, Lord, we want to be in a place where we can see your miracles flow in our lives, in our families, in our schools, in our communities, in our church. Lord, would you do it for your glory? In Jesus' name, amen. So great to be with you today. You're dismissed.